we won't move without you. And I was kind of thinking of and reminded of my oldest daughter, Darcy. She's almost three. Um, she is no longer in a crib. We took that front railing off. And um, we, have, we had to put a pool noodle on the edge so she wouldn't roll out of bed too much, you know, because that's kind of traumatic. You guys ever roll out of bed as a kid? Yeah. So you get, you get her pain, right? And we have this video monitor um, in her room, and she takes such comfort in knowing when we put her down, even though I can't stay in there and hold her hand all night long, I tell her, I'm watching you. I'm watching you on the camera. Like, I'm, I'm watching you all night, and if you need anything, then I'll be there. And when she wakes up from her nap or in the morning, she hollers, Mommy! And if I don't come fast enough, then she, you know, more and more urgent, like, I go potty! She could get out of bed herself. There is no rail holding her in, but she refuses to move without us because it's dark, and when we come in, we open the door, and she can see, and she knows that all is well. And I, I say that because a lot of us have had a really hard week, and guys, I am right there with you. I mean, it has been a, one of those, like, tears and snot kind of weeks where I'm at God's feet in desperation. And like my daughter, I've been sitting in my bed screaming out to God to come and get me. Maybe not necessarily because I go potty, but to come and get me. And so I challenge you guys, be at that place tonight and know that he is faithful and he will bring light into this darkness. Now, I know when we very first started things, who's fans of Despicable Me? Where are my people at? So I was talking to Mariah and I was like, oh, I want to do some sort of like cutesy little video. Did you know that that clip is the book of Romans? That they could never earn the unicorn? No matter how hard they try, they could never hit the target? I'm just saying. It got my heart. And it's so fluffy. So, but also, where are my Netflix binge watchers? You guys are in good company. Because I lose my sanity without some mindless Netflix binge watching. Do I have any, I mean, usually I talk about like Walking Dead because I'm totally Walking Dead, Fear the Walking Dead fan. I've got a Terminus poster in my office. Come check it out. Um, but I also am a huge fan of the show called Blue Bloods. Have you guys ever watched? Yeah? Frank Reagan all the way, guys. So I'm going to do my whole analogy thing again because every time I watch this show, there's this thought that just permeates my mind. Sorry, I know this is going to mess you guys up for worship later, but this is the side it's got to be on for me. I'll try to put it all back, okay? Um, so every time I watch this show, I, I just fall in love over and over and over again with this plot and this theme because, you know, you've got Frank Reagan, okay? And you've got, and he's like the chief of police in New York City. So it's kind of a big deal. And his kids have all kind of followed in his path. He has his one son, Danny, who is a detective. And he's got another son, Jamie, who is a police officer walking the beat. And then his daughter, Erin, is a DA. Now, they are his blood. But he tries so hard not to show them favoritism. In fact, in some ways, things are a little bit harder for them because they've always known Frank Reagan as father, and they also know him as boss. And it can make it really difficult sometimes because people always assume that he is showing them favoritism. And it's not fair, and they're pouting, and they're sulking. And that's kind of what we've been talking about in Romans, right? That we're not good enough. And Nathaniel last week was talking about the moralists and faith versus works. And we're going to be talking tonight about some questions that the people, the audience that Paul had, were talking about and how it's not fair. See, Paul was talking about who the Jews were and their relationship with God and that they had the law. And we're going to be in Romans chapter 3 tonight. Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? Lie, 
Some people slanderously charge us with that. But their condemnation is just. No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. In Romans chapter 3, verse 11, it goes on to say, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will, will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. If you guys have your phones and you want to follow along, we've been using the U version. If you're not really familiar and you're like, I know, but I don't know how to find our notes for the evening, on the right-hand side, there's like that little grid. You click that and you click events and you can go to tonight and you guys can follow along. It's going to have all of the text that we're using tonight there as well as some other key points we're going to talk about. But this is the text here. So basically, Paul is talking to the people and Nathaniel talked about in chapter 2 um, and he made some points and he was just talking about how our works aren't enough. We've got to have faith. We've got to have grace to be justified. But in saying that, and knowing that the Jews received the law first, he knew his audience would get a little defensive. What? They've got an unfair advantage on us? They're in better stead? They're Chief Reagan's kids? Of course they're going to be favored. Of course they're going to get an unfair advantage. Now, all of Romans is talking about how sin won't go unpunished, and no one is exempt, Jew or Gentile. We all fail the law and need his righteousness for our justification or we face judgment. There is equality of mankind in regards to God's righteousness and the law. And we're going to talk about basically three categories of questions tonight. The first one is the question of human identity or the equality of mankind. The next is about God and his nature. And then we're going to be talking about human choices especially in regards to the law. But how does this fit in the bigger picture of the Bible and Romans? See, Romans is about justification. What is justification? Well, it's being made right in the sight of God. There's four categories this year that we're going to be talking about. Right now we're in the middle of justification. But not only is Romans about justification, because that would be a pretty bleak message if it stopped there, but it's because of our hope in Jesus through the gospel, which leads to transformation. It's not all on us. He has done the work. So our key points tonight, we're first going to talk about this question of human identity and special treatment. So basically, Paul's audience was thinking to themselves, and he knows them well enough to know that they're going to be asking, do some people have an unfair advantage? What is the benefit of being the Jew? Is there a benefit? And if there is, or if there isn't, then why do we even need to try? We see this question reflected in verses 1 and 2. Am I special? If I'm not special, then I don't even care. And this concept of apathy. The Jews were not just the recipient of the law, but they were entrusted custodians and transmitters of the law. So when Paul says, yes, they are special, it's because they were the custodians of God's word. And it is through the law that we know that we can never be good enough. There's a commentator that I read, and it said, the Jewish nation was to be the guardian of all that God had revealed through his spokesman. Of all the nations on our earth, God had chosen the Jews to be the custodians of his redemptive plan for the human race. So are they better off? The Jews do not have virtual immunity from judgment. Another commentator said, God is always true to his word. He is faithful to his righteous character. That God's faithfulness guaranteed his blessings was accepted without question. But that this same faithfulness also involved punishment for disobedience was completely forgotten. And it is so easy for us to take the things from God's word that are comfortable or convenient or go down easy. 
but the things that are difficult and hold us accountable will pass. Paul says, even in later letters, that there is no separation. We all need Jesus. If you've got your Bibles or your app open, turn to Galatians chapter 2. I'm just going to read a few verses here, and it says in verse 15, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, so by obeying and keeping all of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be, there's that word again, justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. This chapter here, if you're looking for something to study, actually parallels really, really well with Romans chapter 3. Um, but also over in Ephesians, so just the next letter over. Sorry, my fingers are cold. I'm just going to take a second and get there. Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 11, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. He reconciles us. He overcomes, he trumps the law. We could never hit the target and earn the fluffy unicorn. So he just burns it down. Not that Jesus is groomed. But he just burns it down, okay? And he makes it possible for us to have salvation because we could never attain it in and of ourselves. There are two kinds of men, Blaise Pascal says. The righteous who think they are sinners and the sinners who think they are righteous. I'll say that one more time. There are two kinds of men, or women, the righteous who think they are sinners, and the sinners who think they are righteous. Which one are you? So the second question is the question of God and his faithfulness. And um, we see this in verse, um, verses three through four. When people fail, does that void God's promises? They asked, well, like, well, if the Jews, like, knew who God was, and yet they weren't obedient, and they didn't follow God, then what does that mean about God? Guys, even if God's chosen ones were unfaithful, that, that does not nullify God's promises. The failure of Israel in no way diminishes God's commitment to hold up his end of the covenant arrangement. God will be true even if every person becomes a liar. I am so thankful that the character and the integrity and the faithfulness of God is not dependent on me and my actions. Quick little side story, again, about my daughter. Darcy's just on a roll right now. Um, so you guys know the song, let, Don't Let Me Down, like the peppy pop song. I can't sing, and it would definitely not sound like the song, so I won't do it. I was feeding the girls dinner, and we were just kind of bopping along to the Don't Let Me Down. She's really good at lyrics, so she's singing Don't Let Me Down. And then she looks at me, and she says... Don't let me down, Mommy. Talk about taking a peppy pop song and like stabbing you in the heart with it. <laughs> but I know if I tell that same thing to God, he never will. I can guarantee you I will time and time again let my daughters down. It grieves me, but I know I will because I'm human and I'm imperfect. But our God is perfect. He will not let us down. Spurgeon says, if God says one thing, and every man in the world says another, God is true and all men are false. God speaks the truth and cannot lie. God cannot change. His word, like himself, is immutable. We are to believe God's truth if nobody believes it. The general consensus of opinion is nothing to a Christian. He believes God's word, and he thinks more of that than the universal opinions of man. And can that be said for you? Is a BuzzFeed article more convincing to you than the Word of God? Or the latest blog? Or the latest thing that something in a textbook says? Or the smart, intelligent argument that one of your friends makes? Or maybe some comment that a professor says? Do you allow that to trump the Word of God in your life? Guys, our actions reflect on us. They don't define God's character and His nature. And I am so thankful for that. But there's also the question of human choices and sin. 
See, Paul's audience is saying, well, I mean, like, if God can use anything, including my sin, why even try not to? Because in my sin, I'm just giving God an opportunity to do some pretty cool, gracious work, right? I'm giving him an opportunity to continue to redeem me. If God uses my sin, why does he still punish it? I mean, because it's working out for his glory in the end, right? A commentator says, or one of our excuses often is, my sin ultimately serves to bring him glory, and that's good. God is in control of everything. Even my evil will ultimately demonstrate his righteousness. Therefore, God is unjust if he inflicts his wrath on me because I'm just a pawn in his hand. If God uses our sin, is it really that bad after all? And he mentions this again in verses 7 and 8. Paul refuses to even justify this absurd question with an answer. Okay. He addresses it later, though, in Galatians chapter 2. Again, we were there earlier, and like I said, it parallels beautifully. Um, verses 17 through 21 um, he talks about this some more. He says, But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Guys, when that's how we choose to live, and we're like, well, God's going to use it anyway, we're saying Christ died for nothing. And then on in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. He goes on, he also talks about this, and it's in the notes, so if you want to go and read these verses later, in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2 and 15, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, James 2, 10 through 12, and it's saying that your faith without works is dead. If we want to say, oh, I have this faith, but I can live however I want to, under the banner of Jesus' love and his forgiveness and his redemption, you make a mockery of the cross. And guys, that is a scary place to be in position with the almighty and perfect God. There is um, another quote here, and it says, the failure of Israel in no way, sorry, I jumped in the wrong spot in my notes again. I love this quote by Guzik. He's one of my favorite commentators, blueletterbible.org. It's a shameless plug. I use it all the time. If anybody spends more than five minutes with me, I tell you to go study the Bible there. And he was talking about Judas. And what he had to say about Judas was so good. He said, yes, God used your wickedness, Judas, but it was still your wickedness. There was no good or pure motive in your heart at all. It is no credit to you that God brought good out of your evil. You stand guilty before God. The fact that God used our sin for his purpose is no credit to us. It's his goodness that he's able to take something so ugly and still glorify himself with it. So then what does this text say about the overarching righteousness of God's judgment? God is righteous in his judgment. Guys, we are not the martyr or the victim here. Because we deserve it. What we don't deserve is reconciliation with him through his son. This echoes back to the beginning question, are the Jews better off? Ultimately, no, they are not. Because all have sinned. Everyone is in need of righteousness. And then he goes on, and he actually quotes from Psalm chapter 14, um, 5, 140, 10, and 36, and Isaiah 59, when he says, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one understands and no one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. I sure hope that's not how people describe me and say, my throat is an open grave. It's not talking about halitosis, okay? For death to be what comes out of my mouth, and apart from Christ, our throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips, which is deadly, guys. That's not a snake you want to tangle with. I don't want to tangle with any of them. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. 
Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery. I hope that as a follower of Christ, I do not leave ruin and misery in my wake. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is our destiny and this is what we will be apart from Christ. God is righteous in his judgment. The point is, nobody is righteous. Henry Smith says, He hideth our unrighteousness with his righteousness. He covereth our disobedience with his obedience. He shadoweth our death with his death, that the wrath of God cannot find us. Guys, our whole being is affected by sin. Our whole nature is permeated with sin. Human relationships suffer because society can be no better than those who constitute it. Warren Wearsby calls this text here an x-ray study of the lost sinner from head to foot. And you see that he starts at the top and he goes to the bottom and says, there is nothing good within us. Um, a commentator by the name of Newell said, even Adam was not righteous. Even as the first man, he may have been innocent, not knowing good and evil, but he even was not righteous. So how does this connect with our series this semester about Romans? See, we see these questions that Paul is addressing, but what is the point of it all? And guys, the, the point is justification that Jesus was the payment. It's righteousness. He gives us his identity. When his father looks on us, he no longer sees us. He sees his son. That's what it means when it says that we're covered in his blood. I'm not shandy anymore. When he looks at me, he sees his son. Everyone's in the same place and separated from God by sin, and the law helps us understand that we're incompetent. But we are justified through his righteousness. And the law was essential for four reasons, because it was for Jesus to fulfill. You can look at Matthew 5.17. Because it shows us what sin is. And also because it's our guardian. And this is kind of a weird one, but follow me down this, this rabbit trail for just a second. What does it mean to be a legal guardian? It means that you are not under the care of your birth parents for a season, right? Now, I've got a couple of friends, and they are um, foster parents for some kids. And they, they love these girls endlessly. But they know that the purpose of foster care is never to be permanent. The goal is always to restore them in a relationship with their parents. Man, what beautiful spiritual truth that is. The law is our foster parent. It is a temporary guardian until we are able to be reunited with Christ. It was a temporary authority to help us understand how much we desperately need Christ. And lastly, it's to show us how to live. You can read later in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. The law shows us how to be imitators of Christ. We often live or want to live our faith out believing falsely that we are the exception or disgruntled that someone else appears to be the exception. Oh, they grew up in a better Christian home. They know more about the Bible. They had a cooler youth group growing up. Their church was healthier. Oh, they've been in CCF longer. Oh, it just comes natural to them. Guys, nobody has a leg up on this. God sees us all equally. This thinking also puts the focus on ourselves and not on him. And you know what that is? It's idolatry. There is no favoritism or exception. All have sinned. No one is righteous. We all need Jesus or we will not be justified. And Spurgeon's kind of a rock star. So again, he says, God in his infinite mercy has devised a way by which justice can be satisfied, and yet mercy can be triumphant. Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, took upon himself the form of man and offered unto divine justice that which was accepted as an equivalent for the punishment due to all his people. So let's talk about application for a moment. If you're in the worship team, you guys can go ahead and come because I'm not sure exactly how long we'll camp out in this part. You all have a card under your chair. Go ahead and get it. There's nothing on it. I'm not that cool with my surprises. But see, in this text here, Paul says, you've got some questions I know burning at your heart, and you are not going to really be able to realize and understand freedom in your relationship with God while those questions remain unanswered. And so I want to ask you, if Paul was to write you a letter... What questions would he be answering for you? Maybe with your question, God has already given you the answer and you just don't like it. 
But I got to tell you, it's not up to you to tell God whether you like it or not and get to listen to what he tells you. Do you need to seek out an answer to your question? And that's what the cards are for. See, we as a staff, the officer team in this ministry, we care desperately about your relationship with God. That's why we have devoted our lives to this. So if there is some question blocking you from the cross, if there is some question that is preventing you from going deeper, running faster, pursuing harder, write it down. And then when I'm done here, I'm going to put a bucket in the back. And I want you to put your card in during worship. So it is like your sacrifice that you are just dropping there. That's too public. You can do it later. Or you can slip it by your office sometime. That's fine. But I also want to ask you this question that you have. Maybe it's been answered. And what God's telling you is, let it go. Maybe you need to let that question go because it is becoming such a stumbling block that you are the one getting in your own way. Do you need to instead focus on your justification through his righteousness? Because guys, that is enough. That is more than enough. And it is all that matters. I'm going to pray. If you don't have a pen, steal one from your neighbor. Write your question down. Take it to the back and then leave it there so that you can, in complete freedom, worship the one who has justified you. Precious Father, I thank you so much for the truth of your word, for the way that you speak to us, sometimes in really blunt ways that we can't completely um, understand at first sometimes, um, that you tell us the truth even when it's not comfortable or easy. And God, I thank and I praise you for that and that your son is more than enough. God, I'm so thankful that the way that you are defined is not dependent on me, that when you look at me that you see your son. Father, I thank you that you are not intimidated or afraid of any of my questions. You're the God of the universe. We do not worship someone who is intimidated by us, your creation. And Father, I thank you for that. God, I ask that you would help us just to collide with you tonight, um, that the heavy things of the week would fall away, and that we would remember exactly who it is that we are, and that we would feel so small in comparison to the greatness of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.